Namaste and welcome to Kala Yatra episode 3. Today with us we have an accomplished vocalist and violinist, the most sought after teacher, a great composer, a master conductor of many events in the New England area. She is the recipient of many prestigious awards which include the Best Performer Award from Music Academy Chennai for 1983 and 1984, the Best Teacher of the Year Award from the Cleveland Tyagaraja Aradhana in 2005, the Lifetime Achievement Award from Indian New England 2019. She's the founder director of Anubhava School of Music for Carnatic Vocal and Violin which she established more than three decades ago. Apart from being beautiful and extraordinarily talented, she's warm, selfless, caring, friendly, and extremely humble. Please welcome Srimati Tara Anand. Namaste Tara, it is my pleasure and honor to welcome you to Kala Yatra, a journey through traditional performing arts. When I first came to this country, um, I met you and some of your students at this Tyagaraja Aradhana, the very first Tyagaraja Aradhana I attended after coming to this country in the year 2000. And I was... Uh, so inspired and energized by the quality of music that was produced that day. And uh, looking at you, seeing how you train, how you perform, I have come to realize there are no shortcuts in life. So today, during this tough time of COVID-19, I want to take a moment to pause and look around and uh, be thankful for what I have been blessed with in the New England area, especially the artist community where we have such fine artists like you who have been great mentors and torch bearers for our traditional art forms. So namaste and welcome again. <laughs> How are you? I'm doing well. Thank you so much for that kind introduction. And uh, you and I have now gone back a long way. So it's a pleasure to do this with you. Not because I think much of myself, but I do think there is a purpose. There is a noble purpose to this, is to get our voices out to the children who are learning, who are aspiring, who want to be good artistic musicians and good human beings. So this is a wonderful message that through you, many of us get to send. So thank you for that and thank you for your kind introduction. I'm doing well. Everything I said about you is true. Um, I'm not trying to flatter. People have come to see how beautiful you are. By the way, you look so fabulous today. And um, I've always admired you for many things. And um, being classy, being uh, poised and graceful are some of the things that come to my mind immediately when I see you. So how has uh, COVID-19 changed your life and how has it changed your classes and performances? So in the first place, I think this whole COVID-19 has been beyond what one can describe as unprecedented or strangely extraordinary. It's, it's not something that anybody, any one of us expected. It's almost like being at war, probably not physically, but it is. And the closest I have come to, I think, is when I was growing up in Delhi. Um, I think the only time I have experienced something like that is, I still remember, when India and Pakistan were at war, we used to have blackouts. And suddenly there would be this loud siren. And as a child, everything would go dark. We were supposed to switch off our lights and then hide under the beds and no candles were allowed because enemy planes were flying above and they should not know. They should think it's an empty. If they knew it was populated, they might actually. And as a child, that was the only memory in this lifetime I had of a war, like, okay, what is war? Even then I didn't know what it was. But you know, going through it at this time is very strange because it's an imperceptible enemy and uh, the whole world, we are all equalized in this shock and in this fight and in this uh, brave 
fight to somehow stay sane through all this. Right. So, um, you know, I think I have been blessed because in a way, apart from, of course, the very sad reality of people suffering in the world, which nobody wants. There are so many dying and suffering. That's not what anybody wants. In a strange way, I think this COVID-19 has forced us all to think very seriously about our time, our values, the priorities we have given to different things in our life and boil it down to the essence of what is finally important. Right. Whether it be family or whether it be the time we give to learning, the crux of learning and how important that is and how it gets lost in the myriad programs and shows and the need to be seen and heard. So in a way, I think in the COVID-19 Wanda Talenda, there has definitely been a realization of the true value of learning, right? Learning for the sake of learning. So in my teaching, I think COVID-19 has been this brilliant time where I have been able to convey to the children the importance of just unconditional learning. Right. Unconditional. Something we always did. We always had that because we were never asking anybody. We, I mean, we never opened our mouth and asked our guru a word. Na paad lama, na idupan lama, nothing. We just learned. We practiced. We went back. They yelled at us. We didn't do well and we came back. <laughs> I mean, that was life. And, and right. our only mission in life was to please that guru, to go right. and just get a smile, to do just, you know, just get a nod. I mean, it was not even, you know, these huge, beautiful, extraordinary phrases we got, but just sometimes a smile or a nod. And that's all we worked for, you know. So coming to the question, I think in COVID-19 per se, the classes has worked out beautifully. I think all my students, including me, have realized that when you find this extra time, you find ways, inspiring ways, and in this case with music. So as a guru, I'm pushing them, and as a student, they're receiving my push and saying, you know, use this time usefully. Right. Work as hard as you can and make as much progress as you can, because believe me, Next year in June or July, when we are ready to slowly step out into this post-COVID world, yeah, there will be a period when you will be so distracted, you won't be able to focus on anything. Right. Meanwhile, you think back and you say, wow, this past year and a half, I have learned maybe four years worth. So it will not be that the most beautiful thing. Right, right. As a student, you know, to suddenly wake up and say, wow, I did all this and I could do this because... You know, so teaching wise, I think it has been beautiful and I'm sure many other teachers have felt the same way, you know, that it, it gives them a chance to just internalize and just pull back from the outside world and just think of what they are actually doing and the deep, true meaning of it, you know. Right. In terms of performing, I anyway, as you know, uh, because of my complete devotion and dedication to teaching have been a very low-lying performer. I have not because in my heart of hearts, I do believe that teaching is a profession by itself and performing is a profession by itself. I have, right. I have never thought of uh, maybe I can pull off both. I, I just simply could not do it because when I teach, I give off myself so much that even my learning and my practice is geared toward the teaching, right. not as much toward performing. And that learning and that practicing for teaching is very different from practicing for performing. Absolutely. Because you know this, it, it has two very different approaches. Yes. So in terms of the performing, I think I, I probably miss once in a while. I never went out to listen too much, but just going out and listening to concerts, maybe I would miss. Um, of course, there's a lot online, but I have never been that much of an online person. I right. audio. I still do earphones and old recordings. That's just me. Okay. 
Then I close my eyes and I put on the headphones. So not that much of, but you know, times change and maybe 10 years from now I'll be hooked on too. So, <laughs> but, uh, so that, you know, in a way it has been good. Um, and I, and I hope it's been that way for others too. Yeah, it has been, um, you know, a great learning experience for me as well uh, since COVID-19 started. And as you said, uh, I've been able to uh, tell my students uh, and also, you know, do it myself that make use of this time and try to do the best you can to be productive and learn for learning's sake, as you rightly put it. Uh, today being Independence Day, happy Independence Day to you. And um, I'm so happy to be meeting with a very unique and an independent thinker like you. Um, so you have learned under Sri Shankaran Sharma, Sri S. Gopalakrishnan, Sri Mati Vedavali Ramaswamy, and Sri Mati Tirukmani. And you have also performed quite a bit with Professor T. R. Subramaniam from Delhi. And um, I would like for you to share your experience about what you have come to uh, understand about the guru shishya relationship. And what do you think is missing in today's gurus and shishyas? Okay. So for that, I, you know, I give you a little bit of background on, um, so my first teacher, Shankar Sharma sir, was a disciple of Alatur brothers. So everything I have in terms of talam layam is, is an offering at his feet. Without that, I really would not even have been prepared for what came next. And uh, Vidwan S. Gopalakrishnan was, he was an amazing genius, um, not so well known as a performer, but as a teacher, as a composer. And he was, he headed Vadya Vrinda in Delhi. He was the most brilliant musical mind ever and um, also mentored by Tiger Varadachari. So again, a whole different, complete different methodology of teaching from him. And he expanded the Manodharma aspect for me. And he was, he was just one person. We've all looked at our gurus like this uh, with awe, but he was one person who could sing Bala Hamsa for two hours. And oh. I would sit and just look at him and I'd say, I mean, this is impossible. This is like, you know, this is like something you go deep down to the fountain that's never ending. You know, he could not, he, he just, and he would never repeat. He would never repeat. So it was just, you know, I mean, I don't know. I don't know if I even deserve to learn from him. So he was, that was him. And then with violin, I, um, of course, started with Chandmukhananda uh, Sabala, Chidambara Yarno, old violin with Vananda. Out in the beginning, Arambuchen. And then um, we, I went to Vedavali Ramaswamy, who's actually, she passed away recently. She's the sister of, um, I think you must know Venugopal, the composer of Spencer Venugopal. Yeah, 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 of course. Spencer Venugopal's sister, she was in Delhi and one of the leading violinists at that time. Um, lovely style, very soft. And I think my method of playing, um, the way even I sit and I play, I think everything is from her very involved, very serious, very, you know, and she was an amazing teacher. And then when I moved to Chennai after my father passed away and um, Vidushi T. Rukmini again was extremely generous to just accept me out of the blue. She just, I just walked into her life and she said, yes, come, I will teach you. And before I knew it, I was performing with her. She was the most generous human being because you know, I knew after I moved into Chennai, that it can be hard, you know, getting accepted right. by a guru in Chennai can be hard. Right. You know? But um, by now you must have heard and you know that she was an exception too. She was just, there was nobody like her as a human being, you know. So these were my four gurus. And <clears throat> I think the relationship with each and every one of them for me was just one of complete surrender. Right. There was... When I went and you, you fall at somebody's feet, I mean, as a child, you don't know that. You don't know the seriousness of that. You don't. You just know your parents take you to this teacher. You know, but, but you know that they owned me from the moment they saw me. They commanded that kind of respect, their knowledge, their specialty, whatever it was that they had. They just 
immediately imparted it to me totally selflessly and gave of their music gave of their spirit their values their kindness i mean i there is nothing i can say that can justify the beauty of what they did for me but i think when it comes to my relationship with them i think it's just one of complete surrender with uh, shri shankar sharma shri as gopala krishnan with vedavali mami and tirupmani mami perhaps because they were women they were like not only gurus but uh, true mother figures mm -hmm. they would feed me i mean they would ask me if i wanted to eat i mean i you know they would vedavali mami would let me go unless i ate after like a two and a half hour class and you know and the extent of devotion like i don't know i'll tell you one incident is i don't i'm not comfortable around pets to this day i don't like dogs or cats or i i'm just not i got bitten by a dog when i was very young i had to have those injections so since then i oh. cared silly but where the wali mummy had two cats okay <laughs> wow i go there for class and my classes are like two to three and a half hours and i go sit there and usually when i'm playing the kalyani atatala varnam other mummy or 100 times ask me but kai valikum because it has that much gamaka right he seconds fear and ask to pull him you know it's like you feel arth you're getting arthritis at the age of 18 you know it's that pain <laughs> but these cats would decide to come and sit in my lap oh my god only when i'm playing they will only come and sit in my lap i don't know how they knew but it's the extent of it was not that i was scared to tell her i could have easily told her you know mommy and the cat romba bhay mark mommy and yeah i could have easily told her but you know just the fact that i was in this time with her that was so divine and special even one word out of my mouth about those cats i felt was just not this <laughs> i just as the only time i played with two cats on my lap i cannot imagine doing it now so right. anyway it's just to give you an idea of um you know it is just i think the guru shishya relationship that i shared with each and every one of them was one of complete surrender and love unconditional devotion and unquestioning faith hmm. in what they were teaching me unquestioning faith ava chonna de da veda vakya that was it you know ipridan adaparnam na ipridan adaparnam right and to this day each of them whatever they have taught me apridan apadam you know it's not that of course i have my own way that i color it or sometimes i switch it around to make it easy for a student that i have done because everybody doesn't get everything sometimes right. you have to give something but that's what they gave me coming to your other question of guru shishya relationship of today sometimes i think it's today's world it's the amount of information we have and the amount that we are all doing children are doing and what they are exposed to there's just a lot of choice and there is a lot of um input that's coming at them from about a million directions right especially in this country they're growing up in an environment that's different from what you and i grew up in and our classical arts are rooted in that world and we are bringing it to this world right and, and these children are going out and living their life in a perfectly wonderful american world but very different from what they see at home so there there are these things there there are so many things that are coming at them from different directions that i think what will help them and what sometimes they don't realize will help them as well as the parents is to have that faith and that devotion and that surrender to believe that once you have found the right guru or whoever that may be that you have to believe in them and you have to know that they only have your good you know they are only considering your good they are not right. out to get you or out to make you better than the other person less better than the other person there is nothing in that right i mean a good guru will give equally right you know we went to schools where there were 55 students in class there was one teacher teaching the same thing right why did some come first and why did some come 50th it doesn't matter it it is a different people absorb at different rates and everybody 
even the person who came 50th is probably the most successful person in the world today it doesn't make a difference but it's that it's that faith when a vidya danam onu kudukartha adu vaangikartha oru faith thoda vaanginda i think when you get that with faith you absorb it a different way right when you absorb it with a doubt i think mm. it comes self doubt in you as an artist i think right you know i think at some point it's this karma equivalent you know it if you absorb it with doubt i think you become an artist with self doubt yes it, but if you have that faith then i think whatever you absorb is 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 in you and you have faith in that and that gives you the strength to learn what you don't know right because none of us know everything forget it none of us even know 1.1.1% of anything so mm-hmm. then we have so much more to learn right so i think what i would like to say to today shishyas and to today's gurus first i think be a guru that really can inspire that kind of faith and devotion which means you have to learn well you have to be good at what you do you have to stick to your standards you have to stick to purity shruti taalam illama paate kadiyadu right shruti taalam illama to make progress and learn other things is like a self defeating purpose right ingeme yareme ingeme edthen po porudale that is a you know kind of purposeless so i think it is up to the guru to inspire that in students and it's up to the students and in this case especially in this country the parents to have that faith hmm. and that patience right know that if not today tomorrow progress will be made right and will that be a perfect progress you know will i become hema malini when i grow up no that's not the point right the point right. day to day am i improving day to day am i improving not only in music what am i learning in terms of values am i learning discipline am i learning dedication so under or a or a well meaning exchange with the dinama i think even in this country a very modern guru shishya but yet traditional relationship can be maintained right it requires some work on the side of both parties true very true very beautifully said and that actually makes me uh, want to ask this next question that um, everybody is kind of as you said children are getting directions from multiple sources mm-hmm. multiple directions and um, you know everybody has this uh, time bound issue of you know wanting to finish something and accomplish something and showcase something mm-hmm. so they rush in them to uh, you know prove themselves is more among youngsters youngsters right so with that kind of an attitude do you really think uh, you know children can um, show progress uh and children can really learn uh as you said you know sing or perform with shruti and laya can they perform as in in a short period of time is that what you're asking me yeah so every so people want quick fixes these these days right so because everybody is time bound they want they have a they think they have a limited time in their life uh for some reason they have this notion that i have to by 12th grade i should have something done mm-hmm. i mean it's there's nothing wrong in there's thinking that way nothing wrong with it yeah but they have this this rush to you know get there for some reason and that sometimes you know makes uh makes them kind of go off track from the traditional ways yeah so what is your uh, advice on that so my advice on that is you know yes i i completely understand the fact that and this is completely subjective okay what i feel as a parent what you feel as a parent is completely different what xyz feels about as a parent about their child and their accomplishments is completely different so i completely understand but i think right there again it is for us teachers to kind of set our standards based on what our gurus have taught us namma edhe endha treasure namma innum kaapatha poromo 
on the treasure of Echinder? Is it their treasure? Or are we worried about what people might think of us if we say, you know, Namalala the Madhya, either Narakana Madri lay in the program? You know, so I think it it again boils down to what it is that is more important. So I think as teachers, if you set a certain bar and you say that shortcut la choli tara varad, adore or art separate bar by itself. Other, I don't have that capability, you know. So I think for the teacher to then say that, okay, I think for me, this is a basic standard. I think even I have rethought this and said, okay, if a student has learned for a long time and they have worked hard and they have really put in their heart and soul, parents have been great, they have been patient. <coughs> I would even consider maybe abbreviating the concert. So it's not... You don't have to do a four-hour concert with a complete... Of course, that is the margam, right? When right. you engage them now, Chona, actually, to tell you the truth, Aparna, and I'm veering from the topic, but in India, really, arangetra music, we have to do it. Right, right. That's it. Exactly. That's your concert, right? Right. So, this is a new concept that has come into play because there are so many... I think dance started it, and then we get into the vocal, you know... Right. So then if that has to be done as, as, as a purpose of, okay, just as a reward for the hard work that the student has done, Adile or a basic standard, which I mean, Shruti Tala Merakana. Right. Right. Or a accompanist soda or a kacheri, if somebody is going to perform a concert with accompanists, the accompanists need some talam. Right. The accompanists need that layam and some melody to help you make that Right. A recording listening experience, musical experience. So, as a minimal requirement, I think at least understanding that if you don't have that perfect pitch or that perfect talam, there is a roadblock there. Right. Right. So, to understand that, and it's for the teacher to present to them and say, yes, this is, you know, this is a basic thing. And right. can't, but certainly, I think for the future, God knows when now, post COVID, but, you know, Definitely doing small scale. It doesn't have to. And I've told my parents this again and again. You don't have to do dinner. You don't have to do snacks. All you need is a good auditorium and good sound. Do the child justice. Right. There's no need to. What is important is the music. You don't right. have to spend tons. You just go, make a good job, sing for one and a half hours, you sing. Do a good job. Do a balanced job. Parda Punjam Manodama Panatha decent classical elements of it. Something that suggests that you have actually understood the basics in a right. way. You know, and I think going forward, that is something even I was thinking about is that we need to do uh, as teachers probably is say, okay, you don't have to do it and can and make people understand that there's nothing wrong with that. Right. See, See, it is up to us to, to convey that, right? You know, in this world, everything gets talked about and, and marked with tabs. You know, oh, even four hour, other three, either. <laughs> you know, so think about it. Those right. tabs are totally unnecessary. Right. right. What is important is, was it musical? Did the child work hard? Did it sound good? Are we proud of the child? Right. And those are the priorities, whether it's four or three or two or half an hour, 20 minutes, it doesn't matter. But quality matters because, and I tell you why quality matters, because if we don't insist on quality 10 years from now, it's going to be even worse. Right. Like somebody, we have to hold the bar because either this is not about me. I, you know, I'm not going to be here 15, 20 years from now, but what I'm leaving behind, right, that has to be of some quality. If right. that is of quality, then what comes after we sustain quality, right? And that, again, we owe to our gurus. You know, for our students to not have that ability to carry it forward in as pure a form as possible is something that will reflect on us. Absolutely, absolutely. Not on us, on our karmas, you know. We have to answer to somebody. 
So very beautifully said, very well put. And uh, I think that's a message for many of us teachers um, who have been trying to keep up with our tradition and, you know, art forms. Um, so uh, I move on to the next question here. Um, what aspects of Carnatic music interest you the most? Um, teaching, performing, composing, conducting. I know you have done it all. And I know you have been more uh, leaning towards teaching, you know, for the past many years. But what aspect of Carnatic music actually really draws you into it? Um, I think it's, it's all of the above. I think it's music in its entirety, right? Because music and I are, are you can't separate me from music. And right. any way I look at it, every cell in my body is somehow, whether I, it, it's not conscious. It's not right. like I'm telling myself, oh, I'm not reminding myself when I'm washing my dishes, I'm not saying, oh, Tara, I'm a musician. Tara, Tara, <laughs> it's not it. It's just there, right? right. So in terms of the elements, um, I think, yes, because I'm doing so much more of teaching now, my current involvement is very, very deeply teaching. Right. My composing, I think at some point I would like to delve deeper, but right now I only compose as much as I need to, whether it's Pallavis for students or suddenly I compose Chitta Swarams for songs for my students. I do those things. If I want to do that, I want to do that. That kind of stuff I do, and I enjoy doing it. I love doing it. Performing wise, I think I love performing, but I think for me, both violin and vocal are kind of very intertwined in my soul. So I, if you ask me what I would instantly like to, what comes easier to me to perform, I'll tell you honestly, vocal, voice permitting, because I misuse my voice so much because of teaching, because that's, that's how I started. My first mm. eight years, I was only a vocalist. Then I started violin. Then violin was so much in demand because mm. when I went to Chennai at that time, honestly, now there are so many brilliantly accomplished violinists on the scene. But at that time, there were a few of us, just a few. You know, so there was a huge demand. You know, there, there were many vocalists, senior vocalists, and not as many younger. Mm. There, there was Lalguri Viji. There was, of course, T.N. Krishnan Sir's daughter. Viji, then there was Uksha Rajagopalan, there was Meera Narayan, and my, they were, these were my peers. Right. So when I went to Chennai, it just so happened, I mean, Rukmini Mami Tempoitin, Mami Puravashke, I started performing with her. And then before long, demand took over. It was more of, you know, there, there was no time anymore because there was kacheris all the time. Right. So I think it was just the violin took over. But I think, I think someday, Aparna, if when I cut down a little bit on my teaching, I would, I'd really love to sing for myself, play for myself, do both. And for me, both, like I said, one doesn't exist without the other. So I've been mm. asked, you know, what do you prefer? But I think I am so much of both that it's hard for me yeah. to create the two. But I do know that as a teacher, I'm very clear about the difference. So mm. I, the same song, I will never teach the same way vocally or violin. So, and the awareness of the Guru is Tandrika. Right. Blessing. In the part, part of the night, be part of the night. You know, what has the most impact? It's all about grace, you know. Absolutely. Definitely. I mean, I, I think teaching is what I do the most now and I love it. Uh, but I would like to do, perform maybe next and then composing maybe last because... You know, I, I I first would like to just spend time with my own music and practice and perform for, I don't have to perform for the audiences. I just be happy to do it for myself and my improvement, you know. Absolutely. I, yeah. I know, I know. So uh, how have you managed to be so good at both vocal and violin? And uh, you've also been uh, able to bring students uh, equally proficient in both vocal and violin. So... That is something uh, astonishing, in my opinion. Thank you, ma'am. You know, I, I think it, I'm, and I'm glad the conversation is flowing from this to that, because I think it is, again, it boils down to that. It's the fact that when I learned, first, I think my learning vocal for my first year, 
10, eight, eight years or nine years as just a vocalist, I think was a big help because I got to completely see the vocal end of it. And all my, most of my competitions, singing, whatever I won in Delhi was all vocal. It was mm. never, violin I've never competed. Violin I just performed. So violin there was nothing. But you know, if we our children, we compete with our children. My father was the ambitious one for me. I would never have competed left to myself. But <laughs> my father was the one there, talking of parents. I had one such. <laughs> and uh, so he he would take me, sign me up for everything. So every competition I won was, you know, whatever I did, vocal scholarship, everything was vocal. So I think that was a blessing in itself because I was first very set as a vocalist. So, and then I became a violinist. So again, mm -hmm. I go back to my previous point of, to me, there were this, this, the two very clear art hearts that were a part of my life. And I clearly knew what to do with this and I clearly knew what to do with this. So I think when I teach as well, that has come to me again, a blessing. It's not me. I'm not doing it. It's my guru's teaching is I teach, I treat them as two different arts almost. So it's the mm. same song, the same. Of course, there will be a Chakani Raja and a, a Kaddan Uvariki will be the same in vocal and violin, but there will be other songs that right. will sound very different in vocal and in violin. So I think I never had that confusion. So when I taught Adomor Blessing, I, I was very clear. And sometimes I've had students who've done both. I will tell them, this is the same song. But you know what? This will be more effective if you sing it this way and to be more effective. So I think once again, I've been blessed to learn from the best gurus who have given me this very clear thinking in mm. both ways so that one part doesn't get clouded with the other. Right. And of course, listening, you know, and we have been immersed so much that, you know, just playing. And, and I would say that my violin playing has been the biggest gift of all because I have learned the most of company. Right. The mother, your learning experience and like playing for TRS, for example, he took me on a tour, um, to all of North India, Andhra, I think when I was, I don't know, 15 or something. Wow. So I went with him on a tour and he didn't have to, okay? I mean, he could have found 100 times better violinists, but he was a very generous soul. I don't know what you know about him, but he was extremely encouraging of new talents. Any time he saw a child and he was my judge, that's how I was exposed to him. He was my judge for the scholarship, government scholarship. So, so Apo, you know, he didn't know who I was, but Apram, he asked somebody, who was that girl who sang that Varnam in four speeds, you know. So that was my first introduction to the Tiaras and he, he had heard of me. But then, then when I started playing, he, he said, he, he must have told my father, I'll take her. So I think it was a pretty long tour. Hmm. Just me, my parents didn't come with me. You know, I went along. And um, the best learning experience of my life. And he could have taken anybody. And I'm sure I was not even one tenth of what he deserved. But what a learning experience. Because, you know, I mean, he would sing for five hours, five and a half hours. Oh Vijay Raja, his concerts would finish at 12.30. And this is a girl who had used to go to bed at 10. You know, <laughs> and, you know, and by the time he sang the Mangalam and TRS sang with, I mean, his talam and his swarams were just so good that I couldn't even blink. I mean, I literally had to watch him like a hawk to even produce one-tenth of what he deserved. You know, our swaram parate and that it's like a and that in the swaram, swarakshalam parvaro, you know, so literally I'm like, like this. And by the time the mangalam comes, I'm, I'm ready to cry because my, my legs have gone to sleep. Oh, yeah. yeah. I have moved. You know, right. because it's been so tense. But, you know, it's just incredible learning experience. Upon I mean, hmm. I'm blessing. I didn't know it at that time. Probably as a kid, I said, oh, my God. You know, I could be at home and I could be sleeping. Maybe I thought all those thoughts. I don't remember now. But, yeah. but that, you learn so much. You know, when you accompany, you learn right. so much about yourself and about the styles of singing, about how much can be done. And I had that blessing even otherwise. Nanga on the Delhi, when we were in Delhi, because my father was so involved in music, 
a lot of musicians came and stayed with us. Just mm-hmm. like if they come for learn quest and they stay in your house, or if right. it's is they stay in right. So when I was a child, and a lot of them I've learned from all of them. Doctor S. Ramanathan Rikatam, any or on that one, S. Kalyana Raman sir came. He did a workshop for six months, I think, in Delhi. I went to him. I learned from him. Mm-hmm. I mean, they were all Star Wars. I didn't know it then, but they were all Star Wars. So I have a you know sat with them, accompanied them. So immense learning experience. I mean, I and I think that's why I'm. in both for me i just one and i think it's been easy enough for me to therefore convey that to the students and like that is why and i let them grow in a way that my gurus let me grow which is not impose myself on them which is not say you become a clone of tara which is not to say that you have to do what i do you have to i am there guiding them so i let them fly after that uh, till the arangetram i do hold their hand i have to say i hold their hand a lot mm-hmm. once that's over i let them grow and when right. i let them grow i let them fly you know and i'm always there to hold them to guide them to correct them when especially you know when you're dealing with deeper ragams and ragams that are you know i call this the second rang of ragams and i sort of mean rang ir kaur kalyani shankara pranam to ada murcha china then you come to adanyasi and you come to devagandari right right the nuances right. grow deeper and deeper and deeper so that's when you need that little bit of guidance even i need it i still need you know for devagandari nayaki na adella easy a padra vishayam illa ad absolutely yeah pain and all is out of the question you know so so this is where then i let them fly and i guide them so i think aparna once again i'm just blessed ma you know i just thank you for saying that i'm very proud of my students and i think i'd be proud of them anywhere in the world and that's saying a lot it's not you know so absolutely they they definitely make you very proud and they are uh, very inspiring to other students in this community as well so i'm very happy to be you know uh, witnessing some of the arangetrams from your school and some of the uh, events so thank you very much for sharing that the clarity and the deep understanding of vocal and violin and blending where it's needed and separating where it's needed you know that's a very insightful sharing thank you so much so what have been your struggles and your strengths in your opinion um so honestly i was one of the i was kind of blessed in the beginning because when i started learning music i was not somebody who struggled you know i i kind of got it i don't know how i don't come from a musical family or anything but i never struggled with sapa sa or sari gama pa da ni sa or anything but i think when i realized that was a super super blessing was when i started teaching <laughs> because yeah. when you teach and when you hear a child struggle for just three notes sometimes it's like a light goes off in your brain and you say i mean i did not i did not even realize that this could be so hard right you know so um in in terms of you know as i was growing up and um strength challenges in practice i think it was just we always had a very strong guiding light in our father and he was very is a very strong personality hmm. we just kind of followed his lead i just music was our life apart from academics and even that my father especially in my case because i i liked academics actually i was doing commerce and i was very serious about it but my father constantly impressed upon me that if he ever felt that my academics was taking away from my music he stopped my school so <laughs> oh my he he kept driving me and saying i'll keep you in school alam poindre but this will not compromise be compromise so um i think growing up my challenges were pretty much probably just balancing what as a child or as a teen i might have wanted to do and what i did is was more a personal thing not so much musically right and um in terms of my strength i think 
my biggest strength is my ability at least as a younger person as a younger child and teen was my ability to adapt and be obedient and understand the value seri avai go cholra nama jonathe kekanam i have to listen to the elders and luckily i think that was a strength that listening to authority i would say now i think is a strength i realize that it is a strength now because it's easy to rebel you know it's easy to rebel. it's easy to say and we've learned a lot in this country about rebellion because you know we try to be friends to our children right so we realize we get confused although the trishanku you know we're hanging somewhere there mm-hmm. we don't know whether we want to be like our parents or whether we want to be somewhere here so right so i think for me my biggest strength was my ability to just believe mm-hmm. uh, to believe in authority to believe in god to believe that there was a path that is being laid out for me and whether it made sense to me at that time was not important right but i had my father and i had this path before me and i just followed it you know i think that was my biggest strength and the challenges were just life challenges of trying to balance i mean there's not much balance when you're doing both vocal and both violin you have three classes of vocal you have three classes of violin plus my father had on sundays every sunday without fail 8 o'clock in the morning every musician amateur uh, profession professional would come to our house for a music session and they would leave only at 4 o'clock in the evening oh my god huh and i had to sit for the whole thing i would either sing or play wow the small lunch break and i was never excused no matter if i had my board exams and once when i begged my father because i had my thing my accounts board exam and i had to go to my friend's house to study i asked him for that one sunday off and he said no he said i will burn your book if you do that he actually told me that <laughs> oh that, my god that is how talk of uh, tiger parents he did he did tell me that he said i will i will get rid of this book now if you say that <laughs> so let, let the session be over i will have you dropped at your friend's house you can study as much as you want so i mean that is my journey and i think maybe at that time i'm sure i thought it was cruel aparna i'm sure right. but maybe i would not have been what i am today but for that so many thanks to your dad oh my god i can't i can't really really <laughs> thank you enough for giving us such a teacher in this you know uh, area so i i'm very thankful to him yeah yeah I, you know i thank him every day uh, like i said i don't think sometimes we realize you know what is being said and why and sometimes our young minds cannot understand and I'm, i'm trying to put myself in the place of all these students who are now the age where i was you know so it is hard but you know you don't never know what's meant for you and right i don't know whether i did it whether i did the right thing or not but you know here i am so you most definitely have come on <laughs> so um how do you motivate yourself now to keep up with what you do the way you do it i know you are almost a perfectionist and uh, you never let it go until it is to your satisfaction and i have witnessed it being in collaboration with you watching you or your students perform so how do you manage to keep motivating yourself to keep up with it you know i think um i think a lot of it is just my personality i described my father to you and the older i am getting aparna he was type triple eight times 10 and i feel like i am type triple eight times 50 wow <laughs> then you see that reflection of your later on in life you know i right. never thought i was like him but i am beginning to realize that i am you know it's almost like an ocd tendency it is right it, like it has to be a certain way you know and i think more than motivation i think it is that will that extreme will to get as close to what i think hmm i mean to the best of my ability i'm sure there's much more perfection and if they went to my gurus they they give them i mean my students would learn 100000 things from them but you know what i have been taught to you in in my own small, own small little world what i view as perfection for me that addiction to perfection is something that 
I am always, always paying attention to in everything. You know, it's like I, I, I tell my students the best kind of addiction to have is addiction to discipline and perfection. Hmm. Because once you have that addiction, anything you do in life, hmm. you, yeah, maybe maybe it's not the best advice. They'll also become AAA like me. But the, <laughs> the point is, I think once you get there, you will work hard at doing your best at everything. Everything. That's no matter, no matter what. It might not be the ultimate. And I'm not saying you have to. There is no ultimate up and down. This is an ocean. You know, right. the more you learn, the more you realize you haven't, you don't know. I mean, that's right. what I, every day I listen, I feel, oh my God, I don't know this. I, I'm <laughs> like, I, I mean, it's almost depressing, you know, because you, right. you, the more you think you know, the more you realize you have to learn. And it's almost gets to a point like, I, I don't know if I can do this, you know, but right. that's what learning is about, isn't it? It's, it's, it's like a, it's like a relentless pursuit. It's like a relentless pursuit. You never, you know, you never tire because you Absolutely. know you so much more. So I think the answer to your question is I, I don't have to motivate myself as such because I am very, very OCD about it by nature, mm -hmm. you know, and about everything. And I feel like in, as I get older, and this is true, you might say I'm not getting older, but I am getting older. And as I'm getting older, definitely it's getting worse. This, this, this thought that I have to do it a certain way, mm. you know, and so that kind of drives me. But I think in over the years of teaching and with the experience, I think what has happened, I have mellowed in the sense, I have found different methods mm. to arrive at a certain point of decent perfection. Right. There is, there, there is a level of decent perfection. There is some, there's better and this may be a, a extraordinary. Level. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. It's an ultimate. So on the Mona stage, Vachinda, I think I have come to a point where I have devised certain different ways to get them through this. There are about three roads to follow and they all lead to that. And right. maybe one is a little hill, one is a medium hill, one is a higher hill. But these navigating these three roads as best as I can, keeping the students, um, you know, abilities in mind and their ability, not only with music, but their ability to give it time, practice, their commitment, you know, we have to think of so many things. It's not Absolutely. just, because yeah. in the country, I think that's the thing, we get too involved. I mean, when we went to our gurus, I don't think our gurus cared which college we went to, which school we went to, which courses we were doing on them. In the lung, oh, exam, AP, you know, we are always thinking, oh, and if you have exams, I'm asking everybody, do you have, you have to work hard? Is this stuff? So, the degree of our involvement in their lives is huge. Right. So, when that happens, definitely there is a softening. You know, it's not like, hey, you better do this. I don't care. I mean, I still, I'm known to tell my uh, <laughs> students, I don't care what else is happening in your life. This needs to get done. I'm known to tell them that. So, uh, but, but there are different ways. And I think I have found the different roads. But in terms of motivating myself, I think I really have to say it's my personality. You know, in anything I do, it just has to be a certain way. And I'm not happy. I mean, is that a good thing for me health-wise and emotionally? Probably not. But <laughs> that's just who I am. So it's been a blessing i'm sure um, you know that's that's what makes who you are today so i'm very happy for you um so you have chosen your passion to be your profession so what have been the challenges and advantages of that so i think the advantage again is because it is something that is just in my in my whole psyche now, and it's just me, I can give it my 250,000%. And by with my guru's blessings, I can try and get good results as long as God gives me the strength to do it. The challenge, I think, for me, the biggest challenge, if I have to look at it objectively, is that it also raises my stress level. Because at some point, I begin to wonder if, I had just kept this as, as, just like so many musicians do, just have a few students, three or four students, do my music, 
and maybe just do another job on the side you know right like, i have been a happier and more balanced person that question plagues me every day and will continue to plague me i think till the day i die <laughs> because i i think that has been the biggest challenge is i think maintaining a balance hmm. given my personality because i'm not able to separate from it at right. any i'm not able to separate from my music or from my teaching or from my students from their lives from what impact i am having on their lives from what their relationship is with me it it is a very emotionally complicated situation for me always so advantage i think i am able to do what i do and i have all these lovely children in my life their love and their devotion and and i am very blessed it's a huge advantage challenge on the other side which i don't know how it it is the what if scenario is right. would it have brought more balance into my life if if i had just been pursued the middle path where i just did a few few performances performances for my own practicing few students and maybe done something else on the side that kept me connected to another world that right. we all live in now you know we are absolutely all so i hope that gives you some clarity but it's just it's just what i feel so i hope i was i i definitely see what you are saying and where you are coming from but i i can uh, say this for sure that you have balanced uh, mm. quite a bit and you have really been a great giver uh, a, a true mark of a teacher is giving selflessly and when you start giving selflessly especially when it comes to music you know it really you know makes you this person that you are you know uh, who definitely finds happiness and peace and balance in things that you involve yourself with so i think you've done a wonderful job so thank thank, thank you for sharing uh, those uh, you know thoughts about what it has been so what is your uh, message to young aspiring musicians who want to be uh, performers teachers um, make this their profession what is your advice so to the students who are who have reached a reasonable level of proficiency i would say continue to learn continue to learn and grow and i think there will come a point in your life when you will you you know there are at some stages and we've all been through this there is this one stage where you get all super excited because you have one achievement and then you learn some more and then you get even more super excited and then you reach a stage when you say oh my god i have so much more to learn and you're still good but you reach that realization <clears throat> i think when you reach that realization is a good time to then say okay i think i've reached a point where kunjo knowledge has internalized and i think now i can go about my way of trying to become an independent musician trying to perform trying to do because then you will no longer be doing it rashly you will no longer be doing it just for the purpose of getting on stage you will doing you will be doing it to improve your music and mm. every performance will improve you more because you will learn from that performance right, right. so the student that would be my advice there are these stages and you will know you will know when there is a sense of calm in you you're not proceeding on the stage or seeking performance because you're on a high Hmm. there is a sense of calm there is a sense of yes i would like to explore this and i think i am able to look at myself objectively i am able to sing listen back to my kacheri and say oh nahi the konjam i could have done better you know when you reach that stage i think you're ready enough to perform right in terms of um getting ready to teach i think that is a whole different question for me because teaching requires a lot a lot of self awareness a lot of um you know i think you have to be very honest with yourself when it comes to teaching so the questions you ask yourself is first of all do i know enough to teach 
Right. I, I, that is very important. That is an important question. You know, you can learn 10 Varnams and 10 Kirtanams and think you're all equipped to teach. You know? And then you can learn everything there is to learn and then you can still feel, I don't think I know enough to teach. So where is the balance? Right? And I think in today's age, I think it is very important to be truthful with yourself and see where you are in your level of seeking knowledge and right. to see whether you deserve to then impart that knowledge. So imparting that knowledge requires a certain wisdom, right? And I'm not saying that comes immediately. I mean, you and I know, I, it didn't, I was not just suddenly, I mean, I didn't come to this country and one day Tara became the great, no, 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 no. Experiences teach you, you know, you learn from every student that you teach, you learn about yourself, you learn about music, you learn about teaching. And every student that I have seen has taught me. Mm -hmm. And I am who I am because every student has taught me their lesson in their own way as much as I've taught them. Right. So it is a journey. It is an experience. And it is not to be taken lightly. It is not something you solicit in, in numbers. Right. No, you don't go around announcing, come to me, come to me, learn from <laughs> me. That's not how it works. Right. Know? Uh, a good teacher, one, you need the wisdom, you need the experience, you need the ability, you need the humility to understand that you need to learn more to teach a certain way to make every student learn. You have to learn something different to teach them. Absolutely. That, that is an inadequacy in you that you have to fulfill. So accepting that inadequacy, be willing to work to fulfill that. And then at the same time, you run a parallel course of a life where you're constantly learning and building your knowledge. You're never right. stagnant as a guru. Never, you cannot be. Because if you're a stagnant as a guru, your students very soon will become even more stagnant. Right. So there is no question. You have to be this flowing river all the time. So the energy has to come from the guru, the flowing river. You have to produce that energy. The tributaries can then get some energy from you. Right. Otherwise, you have nothing, you know. And I think that takes countless years of, you know, experience. It takes realization. It even takes this emotional tug of war because right. you need to go through that. You need to go through that experience of and the guru shishya, that chemistry, that pain, Absolutely. that pain. There is pleasure and there is pain, and right. you need to go through that. You need to understand that to come out of it victorious and finally sit back and say, you know, yes, I have done my best. You know, and there are still moments when I have a doubt. I doubt myself. And right. I'm never, I've never been a day without doubting myself. So, you know, that's a process that continues. So in terms of teaching, I would certainly recommend, please do not teach unless you have the confidence in your own knowledge to be able to impart it wisely and correctly. Because you are not just impacting the present, like I said, right. you're impacting the future, the future generations in this country, as it is, we are far away. Right. We are far away from our roots. We are diluted as it is, Aparna. Right. We are diluted as it is. We are not the core anymore. Right. So to dilute ourselves further, we'll be doing a huge injustice to our gurus, to what they have imparted to us, to music itself, to the classicism of music. And I think that is something that every aspiring artist who wants to teach, you think about deeply. And it is not about soliciting. It is about gaining, um, right. say, gaining a reputation and inspiring in people a faith. That's right. right. It is not solicitation is easy. Right. You can walk up to the next person. But when you want to actually earn it, it has to be by word of mouth. It has to be your karma. You have to be a karma yogi to earn that. Adhitaniya varam. Adhvardhvara patient artham. Impatience varkati. You should never be impatient. You know, that's in my small world, that's the best advice I can give. Beautiful. Thank you very much. Thank you for sharing your valuable time with us. 
um, we adore you, we admire you, and we have a lot of respect for you, the entire community. Uh, teachers like you, Durga, Jyoti, you have all inspired me a lot. And uh, I'm so happy and thankful that you've been part of this Kala Yatra and you've shared your experiences with us. And uh, getting a glimpse of that is going to add a lot of value to our journey. So thank you so much, Tara. Thank you, Aparna, because I think it takes a young person like you in, in our musical community to kind of take these, these values forward a little bit more because I mean, we will only last a little while longer, but you will be here. And I think it is important that you carry this forward in your journey with your students and with the musical community, with everybody, because that is a blessing too. And uh, thank you for thinking of this. Thank you for thinking of all these different fun things that you always do. You're uh, <laughs> always looking out for these different outlets and you're inspiring many of us who are closeted and I'm definitely closeted. I'm happy being closeted. That's just who I am. But for bringing us up, for making us think about our own life, for making us generate our own thoughts about our own achievements and what we might want to do, that's a huge thing, Aparna. So kudos to you for Thank that. you. Thank you. You are going to be here for a long time, inspiring all of us. And uh, I consider myself very lucky in many ways. But the most important thing is there is a saying in Tamil. They say, that means uh, when you don't have a standard to look up to, you become the person responsible for setting a standard and anything you do becomes okay, right? So if there were not people like you here, but people like us to look up to and, you know, set standards, I would definitely have not been able to, you know, carry it uh, to this level that we have been doing here, uh, teachers like us. So thank you so much. Thanks a lot. And wishing you and your family a very healthy and safe stay at home. And hope uh, all this craziness will uh, get yeah. over soon and we'll get to meet and uh, talk more at leisure. Thank you so much, Tara. Thank, thank you for being here. Time. Thank you for your time and thank you for this wonderful journey. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank yeah. you. God bless Namaste. you. Namaste. Namaste.